whether you own stock or not, everybody is long. There's about 50 trillion in domestic equities, public equities. There's about another, I'm doing round numbers here, 50 trillion international equities. And then there's about 400 trillion, give or take, long assets. And that includes real estate, and commodities, and bonds, obviously. And that $500 trillion is mostly just unhedged, right? It's just a, a long investment and it just sits there. And for the most part, people didn't hedge that much. The concept of insurance on that um, was, was something that was slow to build, and, but it's been, been growing. And, and that demand for insurance for long assets is ultimately what underpins everything that we talk about. For me, the best part of my podcasting journey has been the opportunity to speak to a huge range of extraordinary investors from all around the world. In this series, I've invited one of them, who also happens to be a longtime friend, namely Harry Krishnan, to host a series of in-depth conversation on the topics of volatility, risk, and portfolio protection. In today's world, portfolio construction is fast moving to the top of the agenda of many investors as they try to analyze and understand the riskiness of their portfolio. With ever-increasing uncertainty around the globe, knowing if you are essentially long or short volatility in your portfolio can mean the difference between ruin and survival when the next crisis emerge. The aim of these conversations is to try and understand the experiences that have influenced these highly specialized market participants and the processes they follow to harness their returns so that we can all become better informed investors. And with that, please welcome Harry Krishnan. Thanks very much, Niels, for this introduction. My guest today is Jem Karsan, founder and senior managing partner at Kai Volatility Advisors in Chicago. Thanks for coming. Thanks for joining us, Jem. Thanks for having me, Harry. Looking forward to the conversation. Now, I know you've been on a lot of podcasts, but you know it's obligatory that I ask you a bit about your background, how you got into this business, and uh, what you do now. So let me leave it to you. Yeah, so I grew up on kind of the border of cultures, born in London, lived in Turkey as a child, grew up speaking kind of the two languages at the same time and really torn between cultures. I think that's actually important. I start there because I think uh, kids that grow up in that environment really start asking a lot of big questions really early. I don't think I realized that till I was much older, but um who am I? Who are these people? Uh, looking at your parents sometimes even and, and wondering like, what are they yeah. doing? Why? Why is that? And then looking at your friends and also being equally as perplexed. So I think those laid a foundation of asking a lot of big questions very early and, and laid a deep interest for um, policy and politics and philosophy and sociology and uh, eventually macro econ. Um, so, and then I, um, we moved to Texas, which was part of that kind of, I think, square peg round hole phenomenon. <laughs> yeah, Tur yep. Turkey and Texas don't have a lot in common. And uh, eventually small town Oklahoma, back to Texas. Um, and eventually my parents moved to Norway. And uh, when my parents moved to Norway, I went to boarding school uh, outside of Boston, Andover. That was a life-changing experience in the sense that it, it really gave me... Um, a, a chance to be around other people that were kind of square peg round hole often, right? Uh, you know, people from all over the world, all kinds of interesting perspectives. Uh, I, I joke that it, it's a, you know, it was a little bit going from like chicks and football in Texas to uh, dead poet society. So it was a bit, <laughs> a bit of a change and it was a much more kind of uh, much more fit who I was and, and, and who I wanted to be and, and, and uh, create a lot of, uh, things that I built upon uh, after that. Um, so I ended, ended up going to Rice uh, down in Texas. Uh, they have a, a great policy institute at the time. I thought I might, I was going to study engineering and, and uh, you know, look at um, the policy institute side because I was very interested in foreign policy at the same time and really was confused, didn't know what I necessarily wanted to do. My, PhD, my father's a PhD structural engineer, he designs offshore oil platforms. Mom's an engineer as well. So I very much uh, had that math and science background um, and interest, but uh, you know, I hadn't quite figured out how to apply it to my other deep interest, which was really uh, you know, uh, macroecon, social policy, 
et cetera yet. I was still very kind of young and hadn't figured it out. And, I, and uh, you know, this was the go-go 90s. I, this is 95 to 99 and probably not a uh, surprise that I, I started trading during that time on, in my free time and taking some of the models I was building on, on one side and on the engineering side and, and through my classwork and started applying that to, much like a lot of kids these days, right? Applying that to um, financial markets. Um, had a lot of interest there. Uh, uh, there was a gentleman two years my senior uh, that at, at school who left, uh, who, who came to Chicago to trade on the Chicago Board Options Exchange floor, trading S&P options. Um, he now uh, runs uh, one of the bigger prop shops here in Chicago. Uh, a gentleman by the name of Tom Hutchinson uh, runs Belvedere Trading. And he, uh, he and I both went to Rice together and uh, he he brought me out here. This was, was the beginning of long-term capital, so there was a lot of excitement in the air. I um, came came out in the summer and uh, and started kind of helping building models. And uh, you know, back in the '90s, Harry, you're probably familiar that you know the, the quants weren't as much of a thing, right? There's a quant, and you know, there are more quants than traders. That's what I hear. <laughs> yes, yeah. And uh, and so I was kind of a hybrid quant trader. Um, you know, and we, uh, they were making a lot of money as market makers uh, at that time with long-term capital blowing out, not to mention kind of, again, the, the, the tech bubble and all the volatility time not too dissimilar from now, it feels like. Um, and uh, so I, I learned a lot during that time. And by the time it came, you know, time to go back to school, they kind of grabbed me by the collar and, you know, were like, you can't leave. <laughs> you need to stay. Uh, how much, you know, how much do we need to pay you, et cetera. And, and so I, um, I settled in and, you know, finished up school and, uh, you know, back and forth. And, and uh, that was my new career. <laughs> so that's how it all began. I, I had a, uh, but, I, but my career really began, um, I think it's important, um, at the crossroads of liquidity, right? Uh, and uh, not just in general as a market maker, but, but importantly, um, watching something like long-term capital management unfold and understanding that. You know, if a 20% out of the money put that was trading $5 a year out uh, can then go to uh, $500 with only a 6, 7, 8, 9% where it was, uh, you know, from, from that moment, um, you know, it, it didn't matter what fundamentals were. It mattered you know, how many buyers are there, how many sellers are there. And that kind of that rubber, where the rubber meets the road approach to what I do, I think, uh, really started there. Um, this broad understanding that, you know, oil can trade negative 30 and that that's completely normal <laughs> in my world. Um, so uh, I think that's the, the beginning. And then uh, I, eventually I, um, I, I was, you know, as I mentioned, some people left. They started this group Belvedere. I moved up very quickly. I had an opportunity to go with them to Belvedere or to move up at the Royal Bank of Canada to a more senior position. I kind of did a put me in coach move uh, or else I'm leaving. And, uh, and they did. And that just happened to be Jan 1 of 2000. Huh. Pretty interesting time to kind of move up to a kind of an important um, post. Uh, you know, we, we subject ourselves to variance every day uh, as human beings. And luck, luck is a big part of uh, success. The right, the right path at the right time um, matters. And, and that was very much true for myself. Um, I, uh, I proved myself through over the next two and a half years, not only to the firm, but more importantly to myself and, uh, you know, found myself in 2003 in, in a very black and white business, looking at how much I had made the firm over the last three years and how much I had made. And much like a lot of other businesses, I, I realized that I could step, a, step aside and do it on my own, uh, and, uh, and probably be better off for it. Um, so I did that starting in 2003, uh, started a, a division of, of Bear Wagner, uh, which was a specialist firm, one of the three specialist firms of the NYC. They were the specialists in the Spiders and GLD and a bunch of other big names. So we had, by starting out a group for them, and John Mulhern, who was the CEO, um, he's with, uh, a, a well-known Wall Street name, uh, was in Den of Thieves, among other, other books. Um, you know, by, by working with them, you know, we had a, a one plus one equals three scenario where they had flows, uh, that they were seeing that would help us kind of, um, on our Delta one side, 
and obviously getting the the, the similar kind of information um, on the on the ball market making side was interesting for them. So we built a pretty dispersed kind of market making operation across a bunch of different products. Had a lot of success during that period, 03 to 06, but uh, they were a billion dollar firm and there's a reason they wanted to diversify is because the specialist business was in decline. And over those three years, um, as you might imagine, 03 to 06, uh, the specialist business was disappearing. And so their business came under some stress as um, you know they didn't have the capital that they needed. We weren't getting the capital we, we, we had discussed and expected and uh, had done very well over that period, made, made enough money to kind of back a, a smaller group. Uh, the S&P part of that operation was doing, you know, and broadly equity of all, uh, I was doing better than, than all the other groups. So um, I amicably left. Uh, John Mulhern passed away in late 05, and that was kind of the trigger that finally was like, that helped me decide to, to move. Um, and so I took five of the guys from the operation and started my own proprietary shop in 06. Um, completely proprietary. So I, I put two and a half of my own money in and um, a similar number from an outside investor, and, and we we took it to an order of magnitude, a couple order of magnitudes more than than that money by yeah, 2010. Um, we became one of the biggest market makers in the equity index of all space. We were about 13 percent of the flow at our peak, uh, the volume. Um, and as you might imagine, as I mentioned, variance is important. You know. Oh, starting a, your own shop in 06 is probably pretty good timing, considering 07, 08, 09 were some of the best Oh, it depends years. on your position. Yeah, well, in yes. the, in the, yeah, as a vol market maker slash, uh, you know, vol trader broadly. Um, absolutely. Fair enough. Yeah. And so um, eventually in, in 2010, I had 98% of my net worth in that business. My P&L was moving probably half a million dollars a day and um, very leveraged business. That was your health. Yeah, exactly. There was a little bit of that too, right? Um, right. And so uh, I had been kind of a meteoric run and I was engaged, importantly, uh, kind of thinking about my future. And, uh, you know, our business was, was very much uh, dependent on uh, bid ask spreads being wide. We had better quantitative models than others. Um, that's part of what allowed us to grow. We managed risk well. We were aggressive um, in taking that risk because we've had confidence in our models. Um, but we didn't necessarily have the best infrastructure or technology. You know, doing that uh, 150 million or, or whatever the number was, um, you know, versus the Citadels and Susquehannas of the world, uh, it's hard to compete on the technology front. So um, that mattered more when when spreads came in in 2010. And so, you know, whereas we had, we're winning nine out of 10 days, um, you know, over three plus years, um, you know, in 2010, we were doing well enough, right. Uh, making money, but, uh, you know, given that I had 98% of my net worth in that business, it, it became clear we either needed to partner with an outside entity, um, on the infrastructure technology front, or we needed to uh, find other avenues. And so, uh, I, um, had a liquidity event, uh, you know, and and stepped aside in 2010. Uh, originally, I was going to, yeah, I traveled a bit with my fiance now wife, and started journaling and thinking, getting back to a lot of those big questions I I had as a kid, right? Um, and uh, thinking more about the big picture stuff. Well, which one does when they're traveling, right? And uh, <laughs> and I uh, obviously the big thing in my head. During that time, was I had a bunch of capital to invest, and I de facto became uh, an asset manager for myself. So, um, started doing more traditional investment, right? Uh, venture capital, private equity, real estate—you know, usual suspects. Um, but as a risk manager and vol trader, um, you know, I think you're always uneasy when you're taking, uh, you know, net risk. Um, even if, you know, which is embarrassing to say, that, you know, thinking that that was 2010, 2011, right? I mean, uh, yeah. um, but you know, the reality is I, I was very, very much a risk manager as, as a market maker More bait. I started layering onto my portfolio and the more illiquidity, um, you know, uh, I, I threw in the portfolio, the more I was missing my market making operation. And, uh, you know, I, that was, there were ways to not play in that space and, and, you know, still 
get that exposure given the models that I had built and the, my understanding. And so I took um, several of the strategies, one in particular that we had used kind of in the background of the market making operation as a lean. Um, I started uh, optimizing and improving it for my own benefit. Uh, I took about 10% of my net worth in uh, 2011 after I settled back in Chicago and started managing that um, algorithmically. Uh, that became one of our three funds eventually. Um, but that strategy was ultimately, you know, a vol arbitrage relative value strategy. Again, uh, makes sense coming out of that market making world, right? Um, that really uh, matched the duration of a, lot of, of a lot of my long beta assets in the sense that it was not a negative beta on a daily, monthly basis, but really on a, uh, you know, it was a counter cyclical um, business that did really well when spreads kind of blew out and there were opportunities. And that strategy really served me well throughout that, uh, the next four, four years or so. Uh, I had several people I knew and knew me in an in industry here in Chicago uh, and family kind of co-invest as a kind of family office investment. Uh, but yes, did very well in that 11, 12, 13, 14, and eventually an institution knocking saying, Hey, we, we had never really marketed a day in our lives, uh, came knocking saying, Hey, what is this thing? We heard you guys are, you know, um, have this strategy that's hundreds of millions of dollars of capacity. Can you build a long vol version of this for us? And so we did that. We built a long vol, uh, fund, uh, for, for that institutional investor. Um, and, uh, basically ran that, um, you know, with about a hundred million, um, of their capital, uh, through, uh, you know, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, uh, 16 and 17 were not a great time to start a long vol strategy. Uh, as we all know here in the vol space, at least 17 was the lowest realized volatility by 30% of any other time in documented history here in the U S um, uh, it was, uh, also the lowest correlations between underlying assets by 25%. So a really unique time. Um, and, uh, as I often say to people, you know, necessity obviously is the mother of invention. And I don't know that we would have ever focused on dealer positioning, um, and all the things that I, I had so much kind of talk about if I had not been for the first time, not you know, been forced to not be a profit maximizing, but tied to some um, other uh, variants and, and a difficult time. And so, you know, we were outperforming our benchmarks and doing everything that, that would have been asked uh, and expected from us. The institution that was invested was very happy, but we were losing money in 16 and 17 because our benchmarks were losing percent numbers. And so, you know, somebody had always been profit maximizing uh, you know, well, hold on here. Yeah. You're not going to come to me with a speech about, um, compounding effects for long vol. <laughs> so even if you're down a little bit, that's fine because. Well, listen, I completely, uh, listen, we have a long vol fund. I, I invest in my long vol fund. I, I believe in the value and importance of it, especially with rebalancing logic. But, uh, you know, as again, you have to understand where I was coming from at that time. I was running a business that was, uh, you know, the, the investor who invested, I, I won't name them, they were very, very smart and, and they structured our, our performance incentives uh, relative to uh, absolute return, right? And so, you yeah. know, in, in, a, in a business where you're ultimately um, drawing down uh, under high water, uh, you know, and subject to some bar- variance. And again, uh, having run a business that, that, that again was always absolute return was always profit maximizing it was a bit of a change you go into the you know office every day and uh, you build great models create edge and then you kind of lose money you know well that this kind of i i hate to cut you off but this kind of points to the chicago mindset correct if there is such a thing as the chicago mindset there are not that many hedge funds in chicago of course there's citadel and magnetar if they're still going and a few others but chicago has always been a prop trading hub where people generally ran internal money like you did. Why did you make the decision to start taking outside money? And maybe that leads us into uh, Kai. Absolutely. So, so as, I, as I was saying, I, I didn't seek to create an asset management firm, right? I was running this um, internally originally, and we had built a team. Um, and there was 
demand that came to us really looking for this long ball product. It, uh, you know, it's, it's a space where there aren't many participants, A. And B, I had spent a lot of time thinking about my own portfolio and how long vol and vol in general, right, fit into it. And I found that really interesting and fascinating. I think it does kind of tie into my broader interest of macro econ and, and getting more involved on that side. Um, and so, you know, at some point, um, I, look, the key, the reason that, that things in Chicago and broadly in the vol space are, um, are more focused on prop is because a lot of these strategies aren't very scalable. Yeah. Um, because they're focused okay. on, on gross exposure. Um, you know, the relative value trades, right. Uh, no, uh, notionally take off in 10 X 20 X, um, you know, uh, you know, these strategies take, take significantly higher gross exposure with low net and, uh, in the vol space, uh, you know, has increased in liquidity, but, but more importantly, um, you know, and, and back then it didn't. But I think importantly, we didn't uh, we didn't set out to start start this this uh, asset management firm. We found a scalable strategy that worked well. We had capacity for it. I 400, 500 million in capacity isn't that much in the broad asset management world, but it's a heck of a lot more than I I have or had. Um, and so I had an outside investor who wanted to invest in that, and and we were creating real edge, and and I saw the value in offering that out. So I think that was kind of how it happened. Again, it didn't didn't set out to to launch it per se. Um, you know, that said, I think what it led to is important, and that's the part I hadn't yet kind of discussed, is which which is the dealer flow kind of framework, and um, and managing you know that long vol product and and uh, and battling kind of the the decay during a period of, of significant pinning is you know led to conversations with the CIO and portfolio managers at that institution about kind of these dealer flow dynamics. And, and I was, you know, on the prop side and in the vol world, we kind of live in a bubble. Uh, you know, we assume that people have these general understandings and, and uh, even if they don't have the specifics. And so I thought they found it incredibly interesting. This was in 2017. What I was talking about, they asked for more proof. They were, they're a very sophisticated institution. The more I started explaining things to them, they, they, uh, you know, especially related to these 2017 dynamics, and the more I explained what was going to happen and why it was happening, and it kept happening, they eventually agreed to allow us to start leveraging up and down in a predictive fashion for the first time, right? Our our positioning in that long vol strategy, and uh, again, it started as vol supply, um, and uh, the successes we had with that. I can't speak to that in numbers, but obviously, late 17 through early 18 in XIV was a big. A successful month for us, um, very successful month for us, and uh, you know, being able to predict that and see those things coming was obviously uh, very uh, something interesting to an institution. So that yeah. eventually led to a lot of um, much more scalable edge. Right, I think what I've learned over the years is that the edge in uh, relative value in the vol space is fleeting. It is. It is kind of, uh, you don't, what you think is edge is often not edge. And the reason that is, is because all of this edge ends up flowing to where the liquidity actually exists, which is in the broad market. And those effects, those dealer flow effects um, are very scalable. Um, and that, um, that is why, uh, you know, what I'm doing now, I think more than ever is, um, you know, the place to do that is, is in a place where, you know, you can scale to five, ten billion dollars. Cool. Okay, so I guess we're going to spend a good chunk of time talking about these dealer. F- Let's start with, with the basics. I know you've gone through this in many, many places, but uh, let's focus just on the S&P options complex for now. Uh, what do customers like to do in space? What sort of trades do institutions like to make? Yeah, so... Um... I guess we start, let's, let's maybe back up a little bit and say, you know, the world is long, right? And you've heard me about this, but uh, whether you own stock or not, everybody is long. You know, it's uh, to paint kind of a numbered picture. There's about 50 trillion in domestic equities, uh, public equities. There's about another, I'm doing round numbers here, 50 trillion international equities. 
Um, and then there's about 400 trillion, give or take, um, long assets, and that includes real estate and commodities and whatnot, uh, and bonds, obviously. And um, that $500 trillion is mostly just unhedged, right? It's just a, a long investment. And just sits, sits there. there. And for the most part, up until maybe 30 years ago, really um, more recently, people didn't hedge that much. The, the concept of uh, insurance on that um, was, was something that was slow to build. And, and um, you know, we saw some effects of that in 87 starting, right? With the kind of nascent kind of people playing in that space and getting too big relative to the participants. And, um, but it's been, been growing and, and that demand for insurance for long assets is ultimately what underpins everything that we talk about. Um, on the equity side, it is unbalanced, and that leads to dramatic amounts of, of demand for insurance in different forms um, that ultimately drive reflexive effects across the market. That, to a lot of people, um, you know, is just, they've seen it from 30,000 feet as, as trends and, you know, talk about the elevator down, escalator up, or... You know, there's a million different adages, right? But the reality is underpinning uh, that the, with the growth of, of, of options and, and broadly in insurance um, have been actual contracts that are absorbed and, and managed by, you know, quote unquote, insurance companies, right? And those insurance companies are essentially the dealers, uh, somebody managing that insurance um, and that risk um, that creates a massive carry trade um, is the best edges in the world are are caused by supply and demand imbalance, and this is the biggest supply demand imbalance on the planet. Um, it is essentially hedging life um, assets. So um, I think when you start there, you begin to see, realize kind of the com the size and importance of this um, on the whole structure. Um, so back to SPX or, or indexes specifically, um, you know, participants are buying puts and selling calls, um, or buying, you know, some form of, of insurance to the downside relative to the upside. And because, uh, they, they, it, because for the most part, um, they need big convexity, big insurance um, a more, you know, again, they're not going to buy, be short the S and P, right. Or short business. They don't want to sell their assets. Um, they really want to own a small amount of something that will hedge them in catastrophic situations, which is what insurance is. Obviously that creates, um, certain nonlinear aspects, right. Um, to, to these, uh, portfolios, uh, as well as, um, certain time related um, aspects. So most people think of assets as the center, which is like, it's up, markets down, uh, bonds up, bonds down. Um, but as we all know, in, in this space, it is there, and, and in life, uh, we, it is a distribution of potential outcomes, right? That are a function of both time and moneyness or, uh, you know, uh, and, and pathways, right? Paths that, that lead across these different um, sources of variance. And, um, and so now there are contracts out there and have been that are, that are uh, in some places notionally traded more than the underlying asset that allow access to that, that full um, distribution of potential outcomes. And uh, these are increasingly adding flexibility ways and, and where and how to hedge and that whole again nonlinear uh underlying um, a set of outcomes and and assets uh really has created a, an incredible feedback loop that um more accurately honestly expresses um risks and returns 
that, that are possible. So I know that's kind of a bigger thing, but in the SPX, that creates buyers of puts, sellers of calls, uh, you know, specifically. Um, and, uh, you know, particularly on the macro level, that's, that's what you're going to see. Okay, well, there's a lot, a lot to cover there. Uh, first thing is you're making a, you're suggesting something, and I'm not sure how strongly you're suggesting it, which is this. Let's say there were no put buyers on the S&P. Would there be no left tail or would there be less of a left tail? Would there be less negative skew? How strong are you making the statement? Are you saying that these reflexive feedback loops between options market maker hedging and underlying positioning are everything or that they're the main thing? Or how do you assess that? They are part of the whole thing. They are not everything. Um, I really look at it as they are an expression of everything. So, um, you know, the second we start with long assets as the primary positioning of the world, and I think that just starts with life. Live, you breathe, you um, your long life, your long life, and your long assets. Um, and you know, the second you start there, there is um, an imbalance to life. Um, and that is uh, death, right? And everybody wants to hedge death or, you know, again, and it's, we're talking in generalities here, right? Uh, death is a metaphor. But, um, you know, I think once you start there and now you allow access to all of, to hedging all of the probabilities of life, right? And, and uh demand for that hedging of, of the probabilities of life will ultimately be to the downside. Um, it will ultimately be um, hedging the likely scenarios that you see where, where you may have problems in life. And, uh, and as a society and as, as a people, we have commonalities in terms of what those demands are. Um, and uh, There's lots of structural reasons um, in today's economy that, that, you know, that's, those are more and more similar. Um, so that let's start there, but the reality is, um, there's an added feedback loop, right? The second, uh, these contracts get created and that demand, um, needs to be provided by other people who are long life. It, uh, who can't just get, get longer, uh, you know, or, or, or just naked, long, uh, extra life, but they can only do that to a certain amount. Right. So, so they must hedge and, and that's what insurance companies do. Uh, that's what dealers do, uh, to keep, um, their nets to a place where they can manage it. Insurance is a great business. Just ask Warren Buffett. Um, you know, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of money to be made in an unbalanced market um, with excess supply, uh, excess demand relative to supply. Um, that is, you can define it whatever you want, but it's essentially a carry trade. And there are other carry trades out there. The key is managing the risk around them, right? The carry trades notoriously have a major tail because at the end of the day, at the most convex point, everybody is long life. So, so who, you know, whoever is short, you know, um, or, or, or too long life, right? Um, ultimately, at the worst time, we'll have no liquidity. Um, and so I think that underpins my view of kind of, um, of kind of the market structure, but take it. Okay, cool. So I'll, I'll have to break it down because the viewership is pretty broad here. I don't want to speak deals, but so I'm an institution, I buy a puss. Uh, you're a dealer, you absorb that put, so you have a short position on your books at which you need to hedge. And so you sell futures against the puts, assuming they're S&P options. And if the market go, starts trailing down, you have to sell more futures. If it rebounds, you have to buy more futures. Is that the basic dynamic that's driving instability on the downside? There's a lot more to it than that. That is the okay. gamma effect that everybody 
starts with. Yeah. It is what kind of the whole world kind of singularly talked about for the five years. Uh, last five years, I feel like uh, increasingly it's more complicated. Um, there are, we're dealing with a multi dimensional surface, not just a three dimensional surface of an option chain, but we're dealing with cross asset uh, dimensionality across, you know, bar factors. Um, and so there's more effects than just gamma. Okay. You can start with Delta and move to gamma, but then ultimately I think, you know, again, with three dimensions, I think the Vana and charm effects are very important, maybe even more important. Let's okay. Let's let's dig into that a little bit. So, let's start with charm. So I'm sure to put, and time goes by, and my puts changed the, its very nature. Basically, its delta has changed. So if the market is flat or up, let's say it's flat, then the puts burning off. So I need to actually go in and buy back some of my hedge. Is that supportive of? indices at specific points in time, especially when the time burn is higher? So insurance contracts every day lead to, uh, with the passage of time, lead to on the index level and broadly, as we were talking about, um, the buyback of Delta. These Deltas are, um, with increasing hedging, are, uh, are increasing in quantity and amount. I think people underestimate overestimate the amount of liquidity in the market. I think that's an important, again, we could cover a lot of topics here, but I think it's important. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. That, um, good. You know, I think it's important to note that there's about uh, $700 billion of, of equities that change hand on, on, um, uh, you know, daily basis on average, um, of which 90% are as high frequency or, you know, quantitative trading back and forth. It is not an actual incremental, new assets going to work or, or whatnot. Um, about, again, these are waving our hands at numbers, but somewhere in the neighborhood of $50 billion move markets a day. Um, that's incredibly small in the context of a $50 trillion market, uh, and particularly a $500 trillion long asset world. Um, you know, this is like Silicon Valley. You can sell 5% of your business and get a value uh, of you know many billions of dollars just based on low float, and uh, that happens in, in markets every day. Yeah, it's the marginal flow. It's the marginal flow that matters, and and the the reality is these buybacks of, of delta uh, relative to the insurance on the whole market. Right, think about your hedging. You know, maybe people are institutions are trying to hedge maybe ten, twenty trillion dollars um, of exposure. Um, you know, the buybacks on, on that can, can be that full amount um, on certain, in certain environments. And uh, so this is not some, you know, 5%, 10% uh, of the flow situation. Uh, again, it depends on, on the amount of contracts, uh, the environment. Uh, and that's just, you know, you brought up charm. I mean, the, the Vana effects are, are significantly bigger when... Uh, that know, was my next question. And the two yes. are uh, intrinsically tied. Right. The two are, are one and the same in the sense that, you know, if, if charm effects are supporting the market, then that creates lower vol, right? Which, uh, which leads to more buyback, which supports the market more, which, <laughs> et cetera. And, and the Vaughn effects themselves are, are multi level in the sense that, you know, generally, uh, term structure is, is in contango. So just time rolling forward creates natural Vana effects because everything, all the option positions are rolling down the curve. So you have Vana effects at level one, which is just that term structure piece. Uh, you have the circular, like I said, Vana effects of more charm effects you have during particularly supportive times, the more, uh, you know, actual shifting down of the curve that happens. Um, and so you get these big kind of circular cycles of periods in time that are very much tied to that positioning. Um, so the reflexivity we talk about often um, about options effects are um, are very much structurally, you know, when that positioning exists, the other side of the people hedging it ultimately are reflexively 
trying to keep it balanced so that leads to a, a less likelihood of, of things happening during those periods. Um, Taylor is always uh, there, right? Uh, it's in the gamma effects that, that our, everybody focuses on are always there um, because the world is long, ultimately. The, the liquidity um, and the tail is, is, is immutable um, and can be exasperate, exas- exaggerated um, by, by the amount of positioning that is out there. But the, um, it's important to note, I think, by, by having more positioning there, it actually makes the outcomes happening less likely, more violent when they do happen. Yeah, I was going to get to that because uh, there are a few stylized facts that I wanted to bring up. One of them is that there have been many more incidences of large, discrete size, let's say 10-point spikes in the VIX from a low base level over the past decade than there were previously. And I wonder if that has something to do with the fact that when vol comes down, whether it's based on roll down or other factors, the amount of potential gamma in the stuff that dealers are short actually goes up, which creates the propensity for markets, if there is a random shock, to really move violently as short strike positions get hit. Is that a plausible explanation? That's definitely a big part of it. And if vol goes up, conversely, the amount of rebalancing that's necessary goes down. So a high fear index actually, in certain contexts, is maybe not stabilizing, but reduces the odds of a blowout. Uh, maybe you can explain these dynamics because they're fairly intricate. Yeah, so. yeah absolutely. So um, these Vaughn effects, which are broadly uh, you know, supportive, go the opposite way right after a big enough move because the hedging, right, um, which were puts eventually become calls, right? Um, I think that's important. Uh, you tie that to the gamma effects and the acceleration. And broadly, that, that, uh, that vol uh, gets more and more pinned under this, you know, more and more likely to be pinned, and then eventually breaks uh, the potential. Uh, I th- you know, I think part of the equation uh, of what you're talking about is ultimately uh, because vol is becoming unnaturally pinned more often, so it's getting to a lower level because of these structural effects, um, uh, you know, more and more often pitting the market and then eventually leading to um, kind of bigger outcomes. Um, I do think it's tied, and, and before I go down that complete rabbit hole, I think it's important to note that, that this is intricately tied to kind of the macro um, kind of liquidity uh, of monetary policy and the amount of leverage in the system as well. Um, I, I don't, you know, that's again a whole other rabbit hole to go down. But yeah, I, we can I, go down that yeah, one too. Yeah, but I want to be clear that I think, you know, the, the speed and size of moves, I don't think can only be attributed to kind of the increase of options positioning. If anything, I would I would argue that the increase in options positioning and, and attraction to that is, it, you know, is expressing, allowing people to express the need to hedge an increasingly leptocurtic. Um, kind of distribution. Um, and, and I think that need is really driven from a much higher level from, from the amount of liquidity pumped into markets from the monetary side. So I think I, think I don't want to sit here and say, yes, this is all a, a function of, of vol markets. I think it's important to start with the money flowing through the system and, and where we are in a macro perspective. That's a point that I wanted to emphasize as well, which is that I think you've done a great job, you and Squeeze, a few others have done a great job educating the public. And people didn't know about this. So obviously you were pounding the table for it. But there's some suggestions that certain people think it's the be-all and end-all. I don't think it are valid because it's been a real attempt to get people wise to this dynamic, which is significant, mm-hmm. however significant it may be. I think it's great, great that you've done that. So uh, appreciate that. Yeah. But go ahead with the the central bank stuff. Yeah, no, thanks. I appreciate that. No, I think the reality again is, is you know, kind of, kind of as we mentioned at the top is this is an expression. It's, it's a tool that is a very, um, you know, important, essential part of, of the whole picture, which is essentially insurance. And I think the reflexive effects of those are very important. But it, again, it is a feature of uh, an important feature of, of, a, of a system. Um, and uh, and I think I think you always have to keep that in perspective. 
Um, so, but back to the, um, you know, the, the actual effects into a crash, uh, or, or a move down in markets, um, you know, eventually that curve becomes inverted. So those Vana effects go in reverse. Eventually, yeah. uh, you know, the move is big enough. So all the positioning is no longer on the tail tail end of the market. Um, uh, eventually you've, you've, the gamma effects have kind of, uh, have, have overpowered kind of these other kind of time, uh, you know, effects and, uh, and everything really all at once, uh, is in the wrong direction, right. When kind of the notional leverage is at its highest and when the liquidity in the market is at its lowest. And so these are all pieces of of an equation in a, in a massively again leveraged system, where uh, you know there just is not enough liquidity to absorb the amount of um, you know life yeah. in the world. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, the uh, some of the research that, that I was involved in some years ago suggested that the most dangerous setup from a leverage perspective, wasn't when leverage was low, but when it was high and dropping. Mm-hmm. And that that is kind of the significant thing to look at. Absolutely, no doubt. I mean, I gave an analogy of um, you know, leverage, uh, to a way to think about it. Again, I think we all know about leverage and the risks of leverage broadly, but I mean, uh, I gave a kind of sumo wrestler analogy, which you've probably heard, but it's, if you have two skinny guys wrestling in a ring, the potential en- energy is very, very low. Um, you have two massive sumo wrestlers, much more potential energy there, right? But it doesn't mean that if they're equally weighted, that the that the uh, you know the match is going to end more quickly, immediately, or immediately, or that it's uh, necessarily even unstable, right? I, I, however you want to use that word, right? But what it does mean is that you know when imbalance does happen, when uh, when one of those wrestlers loses his slipping or, or his his footing, or he uh, or maybe he loses a little weight all of a sudden. I don't know. Uh, you know his 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 pants fall down, and there's just less. You know, guess what? The 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 amount of potential energy, the size of that move, um, and and the energy that that's exerted in that imbalance is, is bigger. And I, I think you know you can get uh, 2017 in a sumo market, right? Uh, where markets are more pinned than ever. That in its own is a leptocritic outcome, right? Uh, relative to history, not leptocritic yeah. in terms of move, yeah, it but is. it's leptocritic in the sense that it's you know thirty percent lower than two hundred years of history, right? Uh, it's an outlier of, in vol terms, yeah. exactly. And so I think it's important to note that that does not mean you get bigger moves; you just get more historic, strange, relative to history outcomes because of the amount of en- potential energy in the system, and and. And that's where we are now, uh, and it really does go back to the Federal Reserve and monetary policy, um, uh, and uh, and the big experiment that we've actually, you know, essentially been running. Um, but we can get to that yeah. as part of a, <laughs> a well, broader conversation. Well, I'm going to try and read between the lines, and correct me if I'm wrong. It will be, but it seems to me what you're saying is I can think of of a program in terms of multiple horizons. So my intra-week horizon is flow-based, flows-based. And my longer-term horizon is leverage central bank slash macro-based. And I'm trying to put on positions that either refer to two different sources of alpha or which kind of blend the two one. Um, Is that kind of the way you're thinking about it? You're You're trading in and out of your flow positions pretty actively, let's say with three to five day holding periods, maybe 10 day holding periods, and making numbers up. Whereas your more macro based views are longer horizon in nature. Uh, absolutely. So prediction um, and effects, right? Uh, uh, you know, from a qualitative perspective, um, have different periods of influence, right? Um, and when you put a factor into your model, the time over which that effect matters is a big part of that modeling. So as you might imagine, if you're modeling a weekly prediction, something like monetary policy and the the changes in it have a longer cycle. And valuations um, have a longer cycle. They are structural 
um, like almost personality traits within the context of a bigger uh, prediction. But there are things that move much quicker. Um, and those flows are, are much quicker, you know, moving items that have much bigger effect on a minute by minute, hour by hour basis. So if you're trying to predict minute hour uh, predictions in the market based on monetary policy, probably not very effective. But um, probably still important uh, to your distribution of your tails. Probably still very important to kind of broad personality under which some of the other, uh, you know, shorter term factors operate. So we're very much looking at them together. They're all part of one picture. Um, but uh, when you, the question is what prediction, uh, what, what part of the, you know, A, distribution in terms of moneyness as well as prediction in terms of time, are you, um, you know, does, does each piece matter? Yeah. Then there's an engineering question, though. What, what do you do? Do you kind of have two separate models generate signals? Or not that you're purely a signal generation shop, but or do you somehow have hybrid models that incorporate everything in one? one? Hybrid models that incorporate everything in one. Okay, that's fine. And are you kind of looking at, I mean, there's a lot of econophysics. I'm supposed to focus on this a little bit in various interviews. And the econophysics suggests that Interweak horizon moves have fatter tails. So as you shrink the horizon, the tail increases. So if you normalize one hour moves by one hour realized vol trailing, you get more 10 standard deviation moves than if you look at weekly returns and normalize by some trailing measure of risk. Um, is that moving into your notion of how to hedge long vol that you re- or how to hedge the tail, you basically need to be focused fairly close in to cover that risk? Or is there something, something more to it than that? Um, if it weren't for the, uh, the issue of liquidity, you were 100%. Um, mm-hmm. But liquidity is an important uh, you know, feature, um, not just feature, it is probably everything, right? Um, as I mentioned, uh, you know, I, I got my start um, during long-term capital. Thinking about liquidity is a major part of, of the prediction. Predicting what the market will do, to a great extent, has to do with understanding what that liquidity will like as well. So we very much are not just modeling you know, things in a vacuum where, where there's, again, second-order reflexive effects which themselves have to be modeled and liquidity is a big part of that. So, um, so my answer would be, uh, you know, we have certain strict rules, um, because the tail is essentially infinite on some of these liquidity, um, you know, a premium. And, uh, so there's things that you could model, but as we both know, at the end of the day, the tail is almost impossible to model yes. exactly. Um, and so I, I think we have very, very clear, um, you know, max uh, exposure constraints to certain liquidity pieces, and, and 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 often in our models are always long that liquidity premium. It's a difficult place to be, um, often, but it is uh, is actually inexpensive over the long run. Perfect. Uh, two questions, which you can answer as much or as little as you want. Uh, Let's say I decide to build two baby gem models. Model one, I try and guess based on open interest how dealers are positioned. And I build a, I build a curve, build a scenario payout curve. And then I um, reprice as time goes by and as vol changes and various other factors change, price changes. And I try and figure out what sort of delta hedging dealers might uh, would that work in isolation or does it require more insight than that? I mean, we don't live in a world of absolutes. Um, can, can we benefit from toy models? Yes. Um, do we need to understand the constraints of our toy models? Absolutely. Yeah. The way you get into trouble is by deploying a, a toy model, uh, assuming it's not a toy model. Um, Yes. So, um, so the answer is very much uh, there is there is value, often significant value, in going 
70% of the way there or 60% of the way there, whatever it is, right? Often a, a big chunk of the value, right? The, the hardest value is usually the last 10% or 15%, right? So um, I don't want to discourage people from, from going down those paths. But as we, as I mentioned, uh, you know, there is a significant tail to deploying a toy model that you don't fully understand. Exactly. And exactly. so, um, so understanding that and, and, and operating it with tight stop losses and uh, you know, making sure you're not short that liquidity tail or whatever it may be is, uh, is ultimately very important. Okay, here's baby model two, toy model. I go in and I look at sentiment data and I figure out which big trades were done above and below the mid. And I make assumptions about whether they were liquidity taking customer orders or liquidity provision orders. Will I get, if, if it's, let's say it's not the S&P, let's say it's oil or it's any market, will I get enough information from that to make reasonable assertions about what dealers have on? The answer is similar to my last answer that, <laughs> you know, that, that you will receive some value from that, um, that, that you will not get all the information that you need. You will, um, the assumptions that you make will probably be if you don't have a good qualitative understanding of, of what, what, when, how, why, um, could be somewhat flawed, but that is still valuable information. It is, you're adding, uh, information to your, um, you know, important kaleidoscope caters and information that, that are helpful. Um, but again, it's a, it's a toy model, and at the end of the day, you need exactly. to appreciate it for what it is and understand the limitations of what you know and what you don't know. Next question is kind of about delta hedging. Probably this refers less to your long vaults than your RV, but um, do you... Are there standardized ways that options market makers delta hedge? I mean, do they delta hedge according to fixed price moves? Do they have a time price blend? What sort of um, things, not what you do, but what's generally done on the street? Is it canned stuff or is, it, is there some discretion involved? The more I talk about this stuff, the more it changes. Um, uh, no, but also just in, in, in general over time, right? Participants become more sophisticated. Um, that said, these are massive flows, as I mentioned. This is the market. And uh, there's only a certain amount of sophistication that can be deployed by the biggest entities when they are attempting to hedge these effects. And I think that's the, the part that's important, particularly uh, banks, uh, particularly really large entities that are absorbing um, this liquidity. Uh, there are and have been historically major markers at beginning and end of day and European Open, right? That, um, that explain a lot of moves based on this rehedging. They've been incredible opportunities in those types of short time windows. If you understand what that, these Vana, Charm, Boma Veda effects are and the environment that you're in um, and what that positioning looks like. So there are predictable patterns of hedging. Um, I think understanding what those hedging, what that hedging is, uh, when it's likely to happen, why it's likely to happen during different periods is ultimately um, very valuable. Um, that said, it's constantly changing, uh, you know, evolving, I guess I would say. Um, and, uh, you know, the benefit, the good side is uh, options, activity and naive participants are increasing. Um, and, and so the amount of edge uh, and, and imbalance, I guess I would say, out there is enough that, you know, that bank probably doesn't care that much, right? Um, they are extracting an edge and a yield from a carry trade. They're hedging the tail on it. Um, and if they are having to give up a certain amount of points, right, um, it's essentially almost like a bid-ass spread for them. There's just not enough liquidity and they're getting enough edge on the other end to happily kind of rebalance um, the best that they can. Could they do better? Sure. But, uh, you know, 
for those that are willing to absorb that piece of the liquidity, they get paid another edge. Um, and so uh, there, are, there are definitely structural patterns, both in terms of days, weeks, months, and even minutes and hours um, that, are, that are pretty telltale signs of, of this hedging. Yeah, I know you've talked a lot about one of the JP Morgan hedged equity products, but we, we won't repeat that bit. Um, a couple of other questions, less perhaps a bit less personal. Um, uh, a lot of people have talked about the changing nature of overnight in indices. Uh, can you say anything about that, about any changes to qualitative features and what may have induced them? Yeah, so overnight periods are, um, in, for U.S. markets, um, time of the liquidity are a time of uh, lack of information, broadly, like at least hard, solid information because of that illiquidity. Um, that lack of uh, liquidity means that people really don't hedge, particularly big institutions, uh, until they have more information. Um, that ultimately means that these effects that are tied to time, time does not move uh, linearly, right? Time um, really moves when information is present. And, uh, you know, and so a lot of models look at it's linear, most do. And at the end of the day, uh, you know, getting into the close, uh, you have a choice as a big institution. Do you proactively hedge any of your day plus one delta? Do you not? Do you wait to try and hedge it overnight? Uh, which most don't, right? Or do you kind of come in in the morning and rehedge on the open? Um, and generally speaking, the answer is try and hedge a little bit. If you feel probabilistically like you can uh, get ahead of it a little bit on the close and then kind of uh, do the rest kind of heading into the open or on the open in some function where you have more information. And then also try and do some at when Europe opens and you have a little more liquidity and information there. So there are these three kind of periods that mm -hmm. are very important, which is end of the day, U.S., um, you know, Europe uh, open, and uh, U.S. open again. So those three periods uh, really uh, have increased volume and hedging uh, of these effects uh, that happen. So understanding that uh, and understanding at the time of each, you know, every night is not the same. Again, beware of toy models, right? Like you have to understand what, uh, what, what you know, uh, what the positioning is. Um, and they're also a function of what the market's doing, right? So if the market is, if you might imagine, not moving much because it's pinned for whatever reason, then you're likely to get these other positive effects, right? Particularly if the positioning is, is in a certain way and vol is at a certain size and the Vaughn effects are, you know, so you can put these pieces of information together and really get a nice um, kind of edge in, in prediction if you do it, if you do it right. Perfect. Next question, again, uh, it's pretty general. Um, obviously, there are products on the VIX and on variants, and they must have some feedback products on the S&P. Uh, how, do, how does that all work? Is that just hopelessly complex? Or uh... Again, if I, if I had to go through uh, kind of the arbitrage models between those, uh, this would be a, a, a boring and, and uh, <laughs> very, <laughs> very long conversation. Okay. Um, not to mention no uh, details. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, but I, but I will say obviously yes. Uh, and and uh, at certain periods, uh, different products um, have more volume, which creates other effects, right? So, I, you know, we gave a very simple model at the top: puts versus calls. But obviously, you know, 2017 was not just an effect of a lot of iron condor sellers, which had certain effects in in the indexes, but also. A lot of uh, retail, um, you know, supply of vol via short vol ETS, um, which ultimately ended up blowing up spectacularly, as we all know, 2018. But that had, you know, understanding where that positioning is and the effects that those ultimately have on these underlying assets, not just in terms of vol compression, but also the kind of left versus right tail, uh, you know, and, and, and again, Vonachar, Vonachar and Vomaveda effects is um is critical so 100 percent there it's it's all part of again a kaleidoscope of, of the vol space uh you know uh, 
call demand in, in the single list equities by retail throughout the last couple of years. You know, we haven't mentioned that, but you know, it's another important feature, right? That's led to massive rotational effects. Um, it's played a massive role. It's not the only thing. Obviously, interest rates and the duration trade and everything that everybody talks about on that end is, is important. But the imbalance of vol across uh, equity, single list, and index has been an incredibly important feature of uh, the last year, year and a half in particular. And uh, you know, not a surprise that we're getting leptocurtic rotational effects now, right? So it's not just the tails again. It's seeing historic moves um, and, and across the market. And that often happens when there's imbalance. And we have significant imbalance there, uh, which has been, again, driven by retail demand for single list and institutional continued demand for vol um, on the put side, right, uh, in the index level. And that counter, counter structure has led to a very, very unbalanced market where the sumo wrestlers yeah. are potentially uh, are, are flying in opposite directions. I mean, this whole idea of reflexivity, as it was defined by Soros and others, uh, most people used to take it to mean that the reason that markets trend is because of the lever. So speculators, uh, when they have winning positions, have access to more, le- more leverage, and so they can pile into the position and it keeps persisting until there's a break. But you're mapping out something that's far more interesting from a complex systems perspective in terms of all of these flows in the underlying and in the options markets and in related markets and so on. And it's really interesting because it's hard to know what's the tail and what's the dock. It used to be thought that with derivatives, derivatives are just priced based on the underlying. Yeah, they're all one. Now it almost seems to have swung all the, the other way around. They're all one of the uh-huh. same. I mean, I think um, you know, it's a function of perspective, right? I think we all want to characterize one thing's important or the other thing's important. They all, they all matter. Um, you know, at the end of the day, you know, that, again, toy model 2017 was pinned because index vol was, was compressed. That didn't mean that idiosyncratic risks didn't exist. It didn't mean single lot list stocks weren't going to move. Um, it meant that we had the lowest correlation of underlying assets in history. Um, the index matters. The single list matters. Uh, all of it matters. It's all part of one big uh, kaleidoscope. And, and Importantly, like reflexivity is, it, 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 is, uh, it is literal. It is, it is not a qualitative idea. It is, and, and again, these, these option chains are a uh, reflection of reality. They are, um, they are a, a much more rich kind of um, complex uh, you know, set, of, set of tools that allow people to more explicitly express kind of um, the real world. And that ultimately leads to more, uh, you know, again, explicit reflexivity. Perfect. I, I think I'm out of questions. I mean, I've <laughs> been asking questions for a while. Is there anything you want to add or clarify that, that I missed? Um, no, honestly, I think, I think that's the big picture. I think, um, I think the more people, um, you know, COVID accelerated a lot of trends, right? Um, I think it's part of what led to this fiscal shift on the mon- you know, on the, on the, macro level, which is having major effects, but it also accelerated a increasing, uh, exponentially increasing demand for more um, non-linear products, more um, probabilistically tied products, more convexity. Um, and I think the access via the Robin Hoods of the world, the amount of money that's kind of flown into retail um, has accelerated the education. Uh, the acceptance, and, and just like any other business, um, there are tipping points. Um, a lot of people think that this this demand for options and vol is is going to is a cyclical effect that is going to ultimately wane once people go back to work. I think uh, it's very much not the case that I think people have um, are learning. I think people are um, moving into what is ultimately a much more um, and what I think I've said before, and people think I'm crazy, but you know, it is the underlying. It is the full um, distribution of potential outcomes. Uh, equity values, bond values, asset values are ultimately a summary of much more rich probabilistic information that lies underneath the surface. And I think that acceptance and understanding is slowly happening, not just to institutions, but, but to, to, to human beings. It doesn't happen overnight. But in a world where we've created an ETF and an ETN for 
every style and every factor, um, the fact that we're still betting on up and down and, and, and live in two dimensions is, is, uh, it's nonsensical. So, um, I very much, I very much believe that, that, um, if you look, you know, 20 years in the future, um, the option chains are, are the underlying. Perfect. Uh, actually, I did miss one question because I gave central banks short shrift. So can you say anything about the feedback loop between deflation, inflation, and rates policy perspective? Yeah, no, macro is my first love, right, as I mentioned. And, um, and the reality is that is so intrinsically tied to the whole machine. So we, we spent just the last hour really focusing on, on the, the, the pipes of the machine. Yeah, but the whole machine doesn't work without the big pipes that you know create the energy or the water or the liquidity that flow through the whole system. And if you don't understand those, kind of the bottoms up approach, um, you know, uh, kind of doesn't work. You have to understand the top down as well. Um, and the reality is, you you have you know people say macro, and that means a lot of things. To me, macro still is flows. It's still focused on liquidity. Um, so my, my mental model of, of macro involves essentially the mon- you know, the fed, um, you know, monetary policy and then fiscal policy, policy and spending. Um, we've essentially had one of those two major pipes sealed shut for 40 years. Um, why for, you know, for 42 years, um, you know, first of all, our founding fathers in the U S created a system that was purposely made to not change laws quickly or easily. Um, in the words of Benjamin Franklin, you have a republic if you can keep it. They wanted to make it very much a, uh, a, a country where laws were difficult to pass and, and it was hard to change things. That was fine until the economy became more dynamic, moved quicker, and ultimately um, Congress decided they couldn't act quick enough to economic crises, so they created the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve is extra governmental, with very, but they wanted to, so they wanted to control um, its mandate, right? To not give it broad latitude. So they created a a very two clear mandates uh, of price stability and maximum employment uh, and only gave them one tool, which is that monetary policy. At the end of the day, uh, by creating extra governmental, an extra governmental organization to, to handle the economy, essentially, there's only been one game in town because the only way things would ever get passed from a physical perspective is in, is amidst crisis or, or a broad mandate, right? And because the monetary solution was faster, um, there would always be a resolution, uh, to that mon- to that economic problem before, uh, you know, government got involved. So the monetary policy has been the only game in town for 42 years, as we know now, um, that is important. Uh, because the whole system, when you create, you know, if you look at incentives, uh, you'll see the result, right? And the incentives have been to these two simple ideas of price stability and maximum employment. 1996, Greenspan realized that, um, that, the government, that the economy had somewhat changed and that more monetary policy wasn't causing inflation. It took the natural rate of unemployment down from 6% to 4% um, and kept doing more monetary policy. This led to the tech bubble. They didn't have inflation and they didn't have to worry about inflation. So their mandate was basically maximum employment. Uh, if that's the case, right, um, why wouldn't you just do more? It's a free lunch, right? And uh, so the world has had a free lunch now for 40 years. Um, interest rates have gone lower and lower. Uh, maximum employment has been more and more sticky at a lower end. And to the Fed's credit, they've done everything that they were supposed to do. It's not really the Fed's fault. The problem is they didn't have a mandate for inequality or a lot of other issues. Um, if you give, uh, you know, in nature, we're getting really deep here again. In nature, if you, <laughs> if you give, if you give, uh, you know, but that's what the, the Fed is doing. Monetary policy is, is free market economics, right? It is, it is empowering uh, nature to, to go about and, and create um, kind of optimal outcomes uh, from growth growth perspective. It is GDP maximizing. We have created a technological revolution almost unintentionally by by being monetary policy supply side dominant. 
Um, yes. We've created the Ubers and Amazons and Teslas of the world. These are all companies that never would have existed in previous uh, periods because they wouldn't have had the cash flow to survive. But infinite cash flow ultimately led to longer duration bets. And this is why growth has outperformed value because cash flows haven't mattered. Cash flows, when, when money is free, there's no need to make money. The need is to capture market share and get bigger, um, ultimately to, in the long run, make money. But to be fair, I'm, the Fed had it pretty easy over these years because there were powerful deflationary forces at play. They created the you deflationary. Know, the of the Berlin Wall. They created the deflationary forces. So, so, okay, opinion. we'll have to d- d- discuss this. Yeah, one, yeah we can yeah. discuss this. Yeah, I, c- I can accept that. Yeah, yeah. Technology has also been def- deflationary. Correct. To be fair. Well, those are the forces. So the the money going to corporations has created more, um, you know, absolute power corrupts. Absolutely, you send money to corporations. Corporations make more money. Uh, ultimately, they they lead to do more globalization, right? They, they influence government to, to to do more. Another feedback loop. Another yes. feedback loop, right? And then they create new technologies. Uh, if you send money to corporations, what is a corporation's mandate? By definition, they have to maximize profitability. Maximizing profitability means lowering costs of their goods, right? And capturing more market share. So that the power of competition, which is what, you know, nature, free market, right? Uh, is ultimately, mm-hmm. and this goes back to Socrates, right? Like, do you give the most, uh, the best violin players the best violins or do you give the worst violin players the best violins? At the end of the day, we've given the best violin players the best violins. And Socrates would argue that that's what you should do because it creates infinitely beautiful music. But there are a bunch of violin players that don't get to make music anymore. Or make awful music. Indeed. And they might and, well be good. Yes, exactly. So, so we have a, uh, a system that has, has uh, created massive inequality. And uh, it takes about two generations for people to, because people don't understand the, the system and, and why things are happening, to feel enough of a loss of status to create, um, create kind of that, that mandate, right? Which we talked about government needed a mandate. Um, and so we started talking about inequality about 10 years ago. It's really built up in five years and COVID accelerated a lot of trends again. All of a sudden COVID happens and we get that populist kind of um, reaction, which had been building. It's what created Donald Trump and created Bernie Sanders, not a political statement. The world has become more populist because of this inequality that's essentially been created by monetary policy for two generations. And so now the fiscal response is where we are. And that's why, that's why this whole thing is important in terms of the pipes and how everything works. That fiscal policy piece that's been sealed shut for 40 years now, had $12 trillion of fiscal policy. $12 trillion of fiscal policy is an order of magnitude in real terms than, than, uh, bigger than the New Deal. Uh, it is about the same size as the New Deal when adjusted for the size of the economy. The New Deal uh, filled a hole of over a decade, which was uh, called the Great Depression. This is not the Great Depression, um, despite what people may feel. Uh, you can look around you, people are doing okay. Um, we have spent about uh, one and a half trillion of that twelve trillion dollars. There's about uh, ten trillion dollars still in the pipe to come, and we are about to reopen. So it is not a surprise that we are having inflation. Um, fiscal policy is has a velocity of one. It goes into directly into people's mon- pockets, sometimes even more with things like infrastructure spending. Monetary policy has a velocity of almost zero. It goes directly to planet Palo Alto. And uh, planet Palo Alto creates Indeed. new technologies. And they're, you know, they're, they're a sophisticated, futuristic uh, people. And they uh, provide uh, new, new self-driving cars and um, you know, things where you can hit a button and things get delivered to your doorstep. They eventually ultimately um, create supply. And that's the thing that people don't understand. Monetary policy actually increases supply. It does not increase demand. And so it is deflationary. Um, that, that is counter. And this is the important point. When the Fed was created, uh, the economy was very different. It was a dependent on labor. And so the trickle-down effects of, of labor getting paid more was enough to counteract those deflationary supply effects. Um, that is no longer the case. And so ultimately, the Fed has a mandate which is completely unreasonable to control price stability with supply side economics. The only way that they can control this ultimately is to pull back and slow capital markets, decrease uh, via the wealth effect 
um, the flow to individuals. Ultimately, uh, there's a lag to that, significant lag. Uh, and so um, they are not in a position to ultimately control inflation without bringing down uh, markets. Anyway, we went down a whole other rabbit hole there. No, that's no, from I, the top down. that's a yeah. great rabbit hole. I, w- I won't press on with that one. I'll just ask a final question, which is, is there an asymmetry between deflation and inflation risk? Is a unit of deflation less dangerous, perhaps, than an equivalent amount of inflation? Or do you have some idea of the relative stability of the two? That's a political question. Ah, okay. Um, and, uh, and, and depends on the society you're talking about. Um, it depends on um, a lot of other kind of detailed factors. Inflation is generally, um, historically, because it's a flat tax, um, more dangerous. Uh, deflation. Yes, that's what I was driving at. Yeah. Uh, deflation, uh, you know, is, is also actually easier to control, uh, you know, uh, between you know, limiting supply ultimately is, is easier in our, in our, in my opinion, than, than managing demand. Perfect. So, yeah. uh, I have taken up a lot of your time. You've packed a lot into your career. You've packed a lot into the past hour and a half. I'm wearing a hat, so I, would, I should tip my hat to you. And uh, with that, I'm going to hand it back to Niels. Thanks so much, Harry and Jim, for a great conversation. I really enjoyed learning about the feedback loop between the options and the underlying assets as well as the importance of dealer flows in the markets and how the world is essentially long assets and the demand for insurance that this creates, as well as the impact of the marginal flows. And of course, the last bit about the impact of COVID and the global macro effects that this has had is perhaps a way to set up a follow-up conversation with Jim later in the year. Make sure you go and follow Jim and Harry's work, because as you can tell from today's conversation, There are many exciting facets to options, volatility, and portfolio insurance, and we really look forward to exploring more of those as the series continue. From Harry and me, thanks so much for listening, and we look forward to being back with you on the next episode. And in the meantime, take care of yourself and take care of each other. Thanks for listening to Top Traders Unplugged. If you feel you learned something of value from today's episode, the best way to stay updated is to go on over to iTunes and subscribe to the show so that you'll be sure to get all the new episodes as they're released. We have some amazing guests lined up for you. And to ensure our show continues to grow, please leave us an honest rating and review in iTunes. It only takes a minute and it's the best way to show us you love the podcast. We'll see you next time on Top Traders Unplugged.